Warning, this episode contains foul language, extremely disturbing true crime cases, and one tall mamma jamma. Listening to Keep It Weird, the podcast for all things strange, unusual, paranormal, supernatural, creepy, sticky, gross, scary, and everything in between. Each week we sit down with a guest or just each other and we talk about something weird. Weird. And this week, still recording remotely, we are continuing on with one of our favorite topics in the whole wide world, our home state of Illinois. We just didn't quite cover everything we wanted to last week, even though we talked forever and ever it seemed (laughs) there is simply too much weirdness in illinois and we had to jump back in now last week was focused on haunts and aliens which was so much fun but this time around we may get just a little darker as we dive into some true crime possible possession urban legend and more i hope you're ready for mystery betrayal and a few moments of ew why because there is more midwest crazy coming at you tonight my name is lauren and this is my co-host ashley Hi, weirdos. Yay, Illinois. Illinois. I wish I was there. (laughs) I know, honestly. I need to get out of this apartment and leave Los Angeles for a hot second, I think. (laughs) Is anyone else fucking tired? (laughs) Are you just plain exhausted of all this shit? (laughs) Yes. Uh, Yeah, I just wish we could go a day without, like, bad news. I know. It seems like it just keeps coming. Yeah, and uh, listeners, I don't know if you heard, California is shut down again because, Round two. of course, it is because you did everything wrong the first time. Because we don't know how to follow rules, apparently. We'll try it again. Yep. Uh, and a study just showed that California's big earthquake, the one that's supposed to kill millions, is pretty much going to happen any day. So maybe we'll survive that. I don't know. Oh, I just keep thinking, like, is it going to happen in the middle of the night and just our ceiling is going to collapse on our bodies and everything's going to be horrible? I'm so nervous. I mean, I kind of wish, like, if it's going to happen and that will, and that is what happens, then I hope it is at night when you're sleeping. I guess <laughs> that's true. Maybe It'll won't. just sweetly take you in your sleep. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> morbid to talk about, but... I know. I know. Sorry we're really bringing the mood down, everyone, but it's just seems Listen, like... I've had a down in the dump stay, and I'm going to bring you all with me. No, it's true. It's like there's no way around it. We just keep getting hit with bad news, so yeah. we, we have to talk about it. And Ashley and I both poured ourselves a glass of wine to yes, have we while we record tonight, because it's <laughs> just that kind of night. What and are you my drinking? toddler is crazy, so that also is the cherry on top. Um, I'm a basic B. I have some rosé. How about you? Cool. Um, is a Zinfandel. Nice. Uh, the biker Zinfandel? I don't know. So I feel like we both have, like, refreshing summer beverages, which yeah, sounds very sort nice. Of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Not really with the Zinfandel, I guess, but sort of. Also, there was a fire in a ship. There was a fire in a ship. Nostradamus was correct. Yeah. Just as I I and Nostradamus predicted. (laughs) Um, The fire started in a Navy ship docked in, I believe, San Diego on Sunday and is still burning today. That is wild that it's still going. I know. Um, It's so bad. I think that I'm pretty sure they're going to stop fighting it soon and just let the ship burn. Like, just let it burn down. Let it burn, as Usher would say. (laughs) Uh, And thank you, Kennedy Cranford, for posting this in our Facebook group. You're the real MVP. I don't think I would have seen anything about it if she hadn't. No, I 100% agree. I didn't see it anywhere. And she posted it. And I love that she was so spot on. It was like, didn't you say there was a prophecy about a fire in a ship? It was like, yes, she did. And we were... I was reading it more as a metaphor of like, oh, the ship is on fire. Everything's going down. And then Ashley was like, well, just wait. Maybe a ship is still going to catch on fire. And lo and behold. Yeah. No a couple weeks later. He did it again. Poof. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. <sighs> you just keep doing it. Um, 
Before we get started with Illinois stuff, uh, real quick here, and, and also speaking of Illinois, I went to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, the good one, and I yes. majored in communications and theater, so basically got some useless degrees. Anyway, <laughs> while I was there, I had the pleasure of being in the same department as a man named Laramie Dean, and Laramie is a playwright and an author, and he's brilliant and funny and just the sweetest guy. And anyway, his works are very much so up your alley. He writes paranormal <coughs> fiction. Bless you. Sorry about it. I tried to hold it in and I just Don't could not. Ever I try didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> okay, thank your you. Your eyes and are going to pop out of your oh, head. You're um, right. He writes paranormal fiction and uh, he has a new novel that's available for pre order right now. And if anyone knows anything about being an author and not being like a famous author, a lot of the time you have to self publish or you have to partner with a publisher uh, yeah. in a deal that's like you have to get X amount of pre sales and then we'll publish and sell your book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, etc. So the novel's called Black Forest and Laramie described it to me as Shirley Jackson meets Call Me by Your Name which is why Ooh. I ordered three copies for myself. Um, I was like, I need one of those copies, I think. I loved Call Me By Your Name. Yeah, so I don't want to spoil anything for you, but basically it's about a boy who goes to college and uh, he has the ability to see ghosts and is pretty much uh, trying to balance a relationship with the man he loves, school, and solving the murders of a bunch of dead boys whose ghosts are hanging around. Damn, that sounds so fun. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm so into that. <laughs> so if anyone is interested in pre-ordering a hard copy or a digital copy of Laramie's book, please just reach out to me and I'm going to send you the link to do so. Yay. And that, that was my only plug. That is so exciting. I'm going to do that immediately. That book sounds awesome. And I need more things to read because we just have nothing but time. Would Wilder let you read? Not really. I mean, I now, <laughs> I know it's funny. I really would have to do it like at night before bed, which would then give me nightmares about violence. But honestly, after he goes to sleep at night is mama time and it is truly the best. And he's mobile now. So it's not like you can even just like put him in a corner and be like, he'll right. be fine. Yeah, I miss the days of when he could barely move because I could just set him down in a circle of toys and he was good to go. <laughs> now it's like, <laughs> oh, we have to like keep you constantly stimulated and give you lots of activities. This is a whole, a whole new ball game. But I mean, he's so he's also so fun. Like in the same vein, when I'm saying I'm exhausted and can't believe how much work he takes, it's also really cool to see him getting his personality and finding out what he likes. So. There's lots more good than bad, I shall say. What if you found out that your child was like, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> I don't like if if he wasn't my kid, I wouldn't like him. Right. Like, oh, I have to love you because you're mine, but I'm not digging not what you're super into. super into your vibe. <laughs> we don't have anything in common. We have nothing in common. Uh, I, I can already tell he's going to be a spooky weirdo. I think he's going to have... The Disney nerdiness of Alex, 100%, but I do Great. think he's going to be, like, split down the middle. He's going to like Halloween and my weird stuff, because we remember how much he loved the vampire ball at your apartment. Yeah, he had a blast. So, yeah, I think he's going to be a spooky weirdo who also loves Mickey Mouse, and that's all we can ask for. All right, all well, right, let's today talk we're about talking Illinois. about Illinois again. I'm starting with Alton, Alton, Illinois, and yes. <laughs> we've already talked about this place uh, more than once, so... <laughs> It's fine. I am not going to drown you guys in Alton, but I do have to bring up some of the absolute batshit weirdness that comes out of Alton, Illinois that you haven't heard about yet. The one thing that you've heard us talk about is most, I think, is the Piasaw Bird, a.k.a. Home of the Thunderbird, our state's most famous cryptid, which you can hear more about in episode eight, Creature from the George Lagoon. Yes. There are several famous haunted places, but also... The tallest man in recorded history was born and lived in Alton, Illinois. No way! Yes. How tall? Uh, well, his name was Robert Pershing Wadlow, and he was 8 feet 11 inches tall. That is not a real height. That so, is fake. That's a giant. an inch under 9 feet tall. Holy buckets, that is tall. I yes. can't even wrap my head around that, because I've seen pictures and video of like over seven foot basketball players and crazy people and I'm already like that's barely a real height but to be 
almost nine feet. Yeah. I don't. I. How does he walk into any building? <laughs> oh, I mean, he barely could. He had a usually the same thing that most people like Andre the Giant and and giant people have it's a pituitary gland situation that gave him abnormally high levels of human growth hormone and uh, i looked up some like stats like if you go to his wikipedia page you can see like markers in his life of like how big he was at certain ages which was really fascinating so like at five years old when he was in kindergarten he was five six Oh my gosh, he was already 5'6". <laughs> yeah, he wore clothes that were, were to fit a 17-year-old boy, and this is in that kindergarten. That is bonkers. When he was nine years old, he was strong enough to carry his father up the stairs to the second floor. <laughs> oh, man. They know that because they tried it. <laughs> I love that they were like, it. let's do they this. Like, I bet you could carry me up the fucking stairs. You're so big. Scoop me up. So he actually became a celebrity after he did a U.S. tour with Ringling Brothers in 1936. Um, Ringling sought him out and asked him to be a part of the show. And I don't know how much he made, but he negotiated what was apparently an unheard of paycheck at the time. And he also made sure that Ringling put him in the center ring and not a part of the sideshow, also known as the freak show. Uh. Like he was like, sure, like I'll do this, but I'm I'm not coming to you as a person who is disformed. I'm not going to be in the sideshow and you're going to pay me a good amount of money. And he did. So good for him. Demand that money. Demand. Get that money. Yes. honey. After that, he did promotional tours for the international shoe company, which provided him with shoes free of charge uh, because shoes for him were so expensive. They had to be specially made. Yeah, I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, he so average men wear size like 12, uh, 12 13 shoe and he uh-huh. wore size 37 and a half. What? Which isn't a shoe what that's is that made. number. Yeah. 37 and a half. Yeah. Oh my god. Also, he was a Freemason. Oh, <laughs> he just keeps just getting fun better. <laughs> that's such a fun side note. Uh then it gets really sad. He died at age 22. What? Yeah. So because of his height and weight, I think he weighed almost 450 pounds. He didn't really have any feeling in his legs. He had to wear braces on his legs. And uh, he was in a 4th of July festival making an appearance as a very tall dude, as he did many times. And one of his leg braces was on uh, wrong or it was faulty or something. And it sliced open his ankle. But because he couldn't feel it. And he didn't, didn't treat it. He didn't know. It ended up getting infected. And uh, he was treated with a blood transfusion, which was like insane, the amount of uh, blood that they had to use um, mm-hmm. and surgery. But because of his um, pituitary gland disorder, he also had an autoimmune disorder, so he did not make it. He is <sighs> buried in Alton. His coffin measures 10 feet, 9 inches, and it had to be carried by 12 pallbearers and 8 assistants. Dang. Yeah. I mean, that and makes sense. he wasn't done growing when he died. What? Yeah. He kept growing? Yeah. That, well, they said that, you know, judging by, you know, how I guess you could tell by, like, the frame of someone, uh-huh. like, the, your bone structure and your frame. They thought that he would grow another three inches. That is insane. Yeah. Wow. So you should look him up. He's in, I mean, if you, so you know um, the uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not on Hollywood Boulevard? Yeah. You can see a like wax figure of Robert okay. in the, like, you know how you can see King Kong? Yeah. In the window? You can also see Robert in the window. No way. Mm-hmm. I have never known that. Yep. From little old Alton, Illinois. Alton, Illinois. (laughs) He he was a tall man. The tallest in history. Alton is also home to another legend. This one's crazy. Deaf Bill Lee is his name. Deaf Bill Lee? Yeah, he was called Deaf Bill because he couldn't hear. I mean, he could. He had, he was just, so he was a drunk, basically. He was like Mm. a notorious drunk uh, in Alton, who had like who was always yelling and like couldn't hear anything uh so they called him deaf bill and uh he ended up befriending the local funeral director bill bauer who was kind enough to sign him into and pay for him to go to the madison county poor farm so he had someone to take care of him 
Oh. Which was very sweet. And when he yeah. died, when Deaf Bill died in 1915, Bill Bauer was like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure he's got to have family somewhere close by. He thought he remembered him talking about his family at one point. So I'm going to hold on to Bill's body until they come and can bury him. So while he was searching for Deaf Bill's family, he was also experimenting with an embalming procedure that he created to see how long a person's body would remain preserved. Oh. And Deaf Bill never had any family show up, Aww. which is very sad. That is so sad. Well, Bill Bauer eventually retired, and the people who took over the funeral home also got everything inside, including Deaf Bill Lee. And they put oh, him boy. on display... For years. Uh, because he was preserved because so well. Because he was so well preserved. Good job, Bill Bauer. That you they did put your job him right. on display in the funeral home as like a, I don't know, like, I don't know. So people would come look at Was that supposed to be their like, advertisement yeah, know, to be I like, look, <laughs> look how we look, embalm we people. dead guy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that's too much. So uh, eventually the charm of the preserved dead body wore off so they put him in a closet where he spent the next several decades wow it wasn't until 1996 when the then owners decided he should be put to rest so they put him in a really nice tux and a tie and they trimmed his Aww. mustache and they put some makeup on him and held a funeral and burial service and hundreds of people came wow to the funeral I love that. And the Knights of Columbus served as his pallbearers. Oh my, what an honor. He finally got a funeral and it was kind of a huge deal, way bigger than it would have been, you know, in 1915 when he passed. Right, but when it had actually happened. Yeah, so that's Deaf Bill. That's very sweet. I Deaf know. Bill. Wow. What a nickname. He couldn't hear it. He probably didn't know that was his nickname. <laughs> he had no idea that that's what people called him. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. So, yeah, Alton is a real weird place. We've talked about it before about how it is. I mean, I talked a lot about it on uh, episode three, Journey to the Bermuda Tyler, where we talked about places in the world that are just fucking weird. Bermuda Triangle yeah. and like and they Alton. They just attract and, the bizarre. Yeah. Like, do they attract the bizarre? Is the bizarre born out of it? Is it just right. a coincidence? Like, I don't know, but Alton Alton is known as the most haunted small town in America. Man. Yeah. I would say I'm excited to move on to your first topic, but you've already told <laughs> me already that it's you. a fucking nightmare. So <laughs> I know you guys. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to put a little disclaimer, as you always do, Ashley. You're so good about it. But this, I would say, this is a big old warning. I mean, we're even going to give you an in-episode warning right now if you want to fast forward a little. This is a bit of a disturbing story that came out of Illinois. But for some reason, and you guys have heard me say many disturbing stories on the show, this is the stuff that attracts me. And I don't know what's wrong with my brain. You got a dark but mind. But I, I do. I feel like I always do pretty gruesome stories. And I remember I talked about cannibals, I think in season two, and got like pretty graphic. And sometimes I have to take a look at myself in the mirror and wonder what's <laughs> going on. But um, I picked this story because I was trying to find areas of Illinois that kind of connected to me and Ashley. Sorry about it. I just thought it would be cute. So I was looking for Southern Illinois things to connect to Ashley. And this disturbing story came out of Ina, Illinois, which looks like it's very close to Centralia. Um, I know Ina. I yeah. Yeah, I-N-A. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't look like it was too far from you. It was even closer to Ashley, which I love ooh, that there's ooh. Ashley. <laughs> yeah, do you want to hear a very cute story? Yes. So Ashley is the town kind of before Centralia. So, you know, when you get like the highway signs that say like mm -hmm. Centralia and Mount Vernon, there is one that says Ashley Centralia. And uh -huh. we would always pass it on our way back from usually from when we went to on vacation to like florida and stuff and my mm -hmm. dad would always point to it and see and say like see we're almost home because there's a sign that has your name on it that is so sweet i know saying like ashley welcome home so i literally was i for a very long time thought that that sign was for me for you i mean why like of course any child would if you see your name on a sign when you're a kid you're gonna be like well that's mine well so that's my everybody sign. back off <laughs> no one touch it <laughs> Okay, so yes, Ina, Illinois, down in southern Illinois. 
there was a family called the Dardeen family, D-A-R-D-E-E-N. Um, and this is back in the 80s, November of 1987. Keith Dardeen did not show up for work on November 18th, 1987. And this was very worrisome because he was one of those guys that was always on time, never called out from work. And when he did, it was like he'd always give plenty of notice that he was going to call out or the best that he could. He was... right you know, so caring of others. And he was just one of those guys that was always at work. So it was very bizarre. He was a no call, no show. Um, So they tried to contact him and all the family members and nobody was answering at the house phone. And they also had an emergency contact for his parents and they picked up and they were like, you know, we haven't heard from him either. Um, So they were trying the house phone. And then finally, Keith's dad called the police and was like, you know what, can we do a wellness check? Like something isn't sitting right. I have keys so you don't have to like go and bust in. I'll let you in. So they go and do a welfare check. Don, Dardine, Keith's dad meets them there. They walk inside and it immediately just feels eerie and quiet. And the house is like insanely clean and put together. But then they go up to the bedroom and find probably one of the most horrifying things that these police have ever discovered. So they go into the parents' bedroom and the bodies of Keith's wife, Elaine, their son, Peter, and their newborn daughter, Casey, are all tucked neatly into the bed. What? And at first glance, it looks like they're like tucked in and just sleeping. But once they get closer, they find that every member of the family has been beaten to a pulp. Um, the mom and Peter, the son, have been severely beaten with a baseball bat that is sitting nearby. And then this is the part that's pretty horrible. Um, The newborn daughter wasn't due for another two months, but because of the stress on Elaine, she went into early labor while she was being murdered. And their daughter, Casey, was born. I know. So she was born and did not make it. And they were all, including a newborn baby that wasn't supposed to be alive yet, were all just tucked into bed while they were dead. So it was, like, one of the most horrible things. All of the police officers still to this day are, like, it was one of the worst things I've ever seen while being on the force. Some of the men had to quit. Um, Men were becoming ill. It was just one of the most awful things they've ever stumbled upon. So Elaine, on top of being beaten, is also bound with duct tape and gagged. But everything else is, like, perfectly clean, perfectly in place. Like, somebody was taking their time and knew they weren't going to get caught. So, of course, everybody is, like, where's keith where's the husband like yeah that would be my first thought of course they're like well he's missing and it's the only thing that makes sense there's no forced entry everything looks perfectly in place so then they're on a manhunt for keith and it's not until the next day that they find his car a 1981 plymouth um just about 11 miles outside of outside of ina and they find his car but keith is inside and dead He had been shot three times and his penis was severed off. What? Right? Like, what on this sweet earth? There's blood everywhere splattered around the car. And it looks like uh, the coroner said that it looked like Keith had died at the scene. So he didn't get murdered at the house like his family and then driven here. It looks like for whatever reason, somebody drove him there and murdered him. And the coroner also found that the family all probably died within an hour of each other. So they don't know if Keith was trying to get away or if he was forced into his car and, you know, they said just drive and go to this place. They have no idea. Um, He was found uh, in the parking lot of a police station in a nearby town called Bentley. They have no idea if this was significant or not. Why was he taken there? Why was the family left at the house? Just so many questions. So... All that was really happening around this time was Ina was high in crime during this time in the 80s. In the two years leading up to this brutal murder, there had been 15 other pretty bad, pretty bloody violent murders as well, which for a small town like Ina in Southern Illinois, 15 is a a crazy number. Like that shouldn't be happening. uh, Did the train go through there or something? Maybe. That's actually a good question. It could be like a stopping point. I don't that think would be something it interesting does. To look up. I mean, it, it goes through Centralia. Um, I don't think it does, but maybe. It definitely could. Um, but this was bizarre, is to say yeah. the least, for this small town. It's like this sleepy little southern Illinois town. There were 15 murders within two years. One of them was a boy who had killed his parents and his three siblings 
and had been found guilty. Uh, and some people believed he could be connected for this, but he, I guess, was locked up just like days before this happened. So he was ruled out very quickly. They also, they lived in a trailer, the Dardines did, and there was a for sale sign outside of the trailer. So they thought maybe the for sale sign attracted someone or somebody was coming in and something went awry. Like they have no idea. They were just really grasping for straws at this point. Like what, how could this have happened? Who was trying to pin it on this family? Um, so everyone in Ina is freaking out. Everyone starts, you know, locking their doors. People start carrying weapons on the street because it just doesn't feel safe anymore, especially after this happens because the Dardeen family was just known as being this sweet, kind family that really kept to themselves, you know, didn't have any enemies. Uh, Keith's mom was the saddest of all because she was like, my son was always known for being the nicest man, would help anybody. They were very involved at their local church. Elaine played the piano and Keith would sing and their kids were involved in the kids choir or Pete. It was just Peter at the time. I forgot the daughter wasn't born, but Peter was involved in the kids choir. Um, There was no history of any drug use. There was a tiny bit of marijuana found at the scene in Keith's car, but there were no drugs in his system or his wife. So they believe like maybe the murderer had left it behind. Still, marijuana is. Yeah. Of everything. Not <laughs> drugs. Nice. 100%. I mean, like, it is, but it's not. No, you're completely right. It's like having and a wine think... cooler. <laughs> Just having a nice little white wine It's like there, there was Boone's Farm, so you know <laughs> they were up to no good. There was a Smirnoff ice in the cup holder, so it was terrible. Yeah. No, it was such a tiny amount anyway. It barely meant anything, but they were just, they like I said, they were grasping for anything. Yeah. But there were no drugs in their system, so they think whoever the murderer was just left it behind. Another crazy thing is that back at the house, nothing was stolen, and there were plenty of valuables in plain sight, like really nice jewelry, a nice VCR. Remember, this is the 80s. A really nice VCR and a camcorder sitting out in the living room, but nothing was stolen. No cash, no um, expensive appliances, anything. And like I said, everything had also been cleaned and kind of put together. So it seemed like this weird, very personal attack on this family. But I hate this because still to this day, I hate cold cases so much, but there is no solution. What? Nobody is there's not even any leads. Nobody has anything. It went on America's Most Wanted. They ran a segment for it because the show was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. I can't believe nobody has solved this. And they put their usual phone number at the end. Nobody even called in with any leads. Nobody had anything. Oh my God. Um, Oprah Winfrey almost ran it on her show because she felt so bad for the people of this town and for Keith's family who really wanted closure, but she at the last second decided not to air it because the story is so disturbing. She was like, I don't think this is for my audience. So she didn't air it at the last second, but it like really tugged at her heartstrings. And um, there was one like tiny blip on the radar of this serial killer who was mostly popular in Texas, but did go through Illinois for a time. His name was Tommy Lynn Sells. And in the year 2000, he confessed to the murder of them But his story wasn't really lining up and it was constantly changing when he was like barking it off to anybody who would listen in prison. Um, And so everybody kind of ruled him out and investigators said, you know, we we gave him the time of day for a few weeks, but his story just isn't adding up. And he confessed to over 100 crimes and only 20 of them match up to his story or have you know, evidence that points to him. So he ended up getting executed a couple years later. Um, after he confessed to it and he was executed for the crimes he committed and nothing more. They didn't think it was worth pursuing, but he was really the only lead that they had for a second. They don't have anything else. No one in the family seemed suspicious, nothing. And everything was cleaned so well that there really was no trace. So it is still open to this day and people are still asking if you have any knowledge of this, if you live in Illinois or close by or have heard of this or know the family to please let local authorities know it's still open and trying to be solved, but it's it's a mystery and it's Jesus. so sad. Man. Uh yikes. Well, you were right. Know, that right? story was horrifying and I hated it. It is. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll have to ask my parents too if they remember. I mean, I'm sure they do. Yeah, I bet they would know or like remember something about it because I'm sure it like rocked Southern Illinois at the time. Yeah. Well, my next topic. um, (laughs) (laughs) 
moving right along. Moving right along. My next topic is something that I felt compelled to research and I felt like I had a responsibility to learn more about because it's something I had zero appreciation for growing up in Southern Illinois. And (laughs) part of that I blame on my teachers who found absolutely no way to make history interesting, but also partially just like youth and not understanding the significance of the past. Sure. But anyway, I want to talk about Cahokia Mounds. Oh, I'm so excited because I don't know a lot about them either. Only like tiny, tiny things. So bring it on. If you grew up in Southern Illinois, you had a field trip to Cahokia Mounds. Um, sure. And sounds right. All I remember about my visit is that it wasn't as fun as our field trip to the zoo or the time we went to Six Flags. Like, how <laughs> can you compare those you things? Again, when you're a kid, that's what's important. You can't argue with Yeah, that. it's like, remember when we went to the fucking zoo? Like, why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Cahokia Mounds are in Cahokia, Illinois, and they're named after the Cahokia tribe. And they are the remains of Illinois' most ancient city. And not only that, Cahokia was the largest and most influential urban settlement of the Mississippian culture, which um, they developed advanced societies across most of what is now central and southeastern United States. So Cahokia uh-huh. was the hub. Okay. And I think that when people think of North America pre-Europeans, they think of small groups of quote-unquote Indians spread out. Um, but there were literal like civilizations. There were huge cities. Cahokia alone yeah. probably had 30,000 residents. Yeah, that's nothing to scoff yeah. at. My hometown has like 12,000. So. I was going to say, yeah, Metamora has like 3,000. At the apex of its population, it exceeded the size of London at the time. So Dang. it was big. Yeah, very big. And I try really hard not to hop up on this soapbox that's right here, but it's so tempting. So I'm just going to step up real quick with a side note. A lot of people don't understand why Native Americans don't really care to be referred to as Indians. Uh huh. The entire reason they're called Indians is because when dipshit Columbus accidentally found Haiti, he thought he was in India. Mm -hmm. So he called the Native people Indians when they, in fact, were not Indians. And even though they were like, no, this isn't India, white people were like, whatever, you're Indians forever. So yep. call them what they name. are. Yeah. <laughs> they are Native Americans. They were here first. Calling them Indians is insulting and it makes you sound uneducated. And it makes you sound like a fool like Columbus. <sighs> yeah. It makes you sound like you're not smart. <laughs> so Cahokia is amazing. Yes, tell me more. 11-year-old me is such a fucking asshole for not being (laughs) amazed by this. So the Cahokia Mounds originally included 120 man-made mounds, and they were all different sizes and shapes. They all had different functions. Today, it's a nationally protected historical landmark, and about 80 of the mounds remain. The Mississippians were all mound builders, and basically it's sort of the same thing as like pyramids, but different materials were used. Okay. And, you know, they were used for religious purposes and some were used to bury people or um, some were elite living quarters. They could also be used as public landmarks for seasonal gatherings like annual harvest festivals and stuff. Okay. Cahokia is wildly believed. Wildly. (laughs) Cahokia. (laughs) Wildly believed. uh, No, Cahokia is widely believed to not only be the hub for all of these civilizations, but more importantly, a sacred place. And Cahokia specifically is crazy complex. It's a detailed planned city grid, and the alignment of the mounds is believed to be tied to not only the summer solstice sunrise, but also the southern maximum moonrise, which orients Cahokia to the movement of both the sun and the moon. Oh, wow. Cahokia is cool. It's cool and it's crazy complex. A lot of the mounds were planned out by architects who laid out structures and then directed the work crews. It's very advanced stuff. Yeah. And it's so advanced that when the English settlers first arrived, they encountered, you know, thousands of the mounds all around and assumed that there was no way that these, you know, quote, savages were intellectually capable enough of carrying out major public works, which is the whitest thing I've ever heard. I was going to say the whitest thing you could say. (laughs) So for a long time, 
They believed that advanced societies or even mystical societies lived there a long time ago and then were wiped out by the natives. Man. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson, the bastard, uh, he (laughs) actually performed one of the first excavations at Cahokia and he wrote in 1785 that he believed that they were mass graves constructed by Native Americans. So good job there, Tom. Yeah. But even at that time in 1785, other colonists maintained that the mountains were built by something potentially magical, definitely white. Uh Literally, one of the theories was that they believed they were built basically by the same people who inhabited the lost city of Atlantis. Oh, boy. Okay. Which probably isn't even real. (laughs) I like the um, theory. I'll dig it. (laughs) Yeah, sure. (laughs) Sure, why not? uh, The desire for the mound builders to have been part of some exotic, ancient, white group was persistent for a couple of reasons. One was kind of uh, shame, basically. Yeah. Because the evidence of these lost civilizations in the Midwest would show that the United States had a deep and honorable heritage and it wasn't mm-hmm. just some empty land full of, you know, savages that a band of revolutionaries made into something great. Right. And then the other reason was the opposite of that, just like greed and racism. They wanted the land, they took it any way they could, um, mm-hmm. killing thousands of them by force, millions of them by disease. That was the American way. That's that's our that's it. That's what we we do. do I also read this um, statistic that kind of blew me away. I didn't know Uh, when Europeans showed up, they killed off ninety to ninety five percent of the native population. What ninety to ninety five percent of them? Oh my gosh, it's like everybody. Yeah, and you that know, most horrific. of it was disease, and not that we like gave them purposefully gave them diseases. They just had never encountered the diseases right. that they we had brought everything over. Yeah. yeah. So, oh my gosh, that's horrible. But the lust it's for so the horrible. land and the absolute hatred for Native Americans who the land belonged to, you know, they felt that if people were led to believe that the mounds were built by some ancient mystical white civilization who were killed by the natives would make it easier to kick them off of there right then they could be like oh okay this is fine we should be taking over this land because they did something who cares yeah so anyway these stupid myths were finally debunked in 1894 by cyrus thomas and william h holmes who found several tribes who were still mound builders and excavated the abandoned mounds and found artifacts and objects that were undeniably native american good so the Cahokia Mound, some individual cool little mound facts. One of the mounds, known as Monk's Mound, is the largest man-made earthen mound north of Mexico. Uh, and it is 10 stories tall. Whoa. It's what? huge. Yeah, it's enormous. Wait, how can a mound be that tall? <laughs> I know. They actually, they built stairs so that you can actually like climb it climb over it i do remember that part and being like why would anyone fucking do this this sucks it's summer (laughs) in illinois it's a hundred degrees don't want to climb right now oh my gosh yeah so it's enormous uh another mound amazing known simply as mound 72 is the crazy mound this was the burial mound uh well one of several there are a lot of bodies here, and it's really interesting the different kinds of bodies. You know, usually it's like this this mound is for, or this place is for rich people and rulers, yeah. and this place is for sacrifices. This had kind of a little bit of everything. One of the remains is a man in his 40s who experts believe to be an important Cahokian ruler. He was buried on a bed of more than 20,000 beads arranged in the shape of a falcon. The falcon warrior or bird man is a common figure in Mississippian culture. That is very fancy. There were also a variety of very detailed arrowheads found near the grave. And these arrowheads are cool, too, because they were four different types of arrowhead, each from a different geographical region, which just goes to show Cahokia's trade links in North America and how many different tribes came to this area, which is another reason that people think it was like, you know the place to be for like the harvest festival or for whatever yeah Yeah. it's Um, the center that's so cool yeah but archaeologists found more than 250 other skeletons in mount 72 
They believe that 62% of them are sacrificial victims based on signs of ritual execution, method of burial, and other factors. These skeletons include four young males missing their hands and skulls. Okay. A mass grave of more than 50 women who are all around 21 years old. All right. A mass burial containing 40 men and women who appear to have been violently killed, some of which may have been buried alive. Oh, that gives me the willies. That's my biggest fear. Yeah. Which apparently they can tell because some of them are positioned as such that they look like they're trying to dig their way out. Oh, man. (sighs) All of the burials happened at different times. So the mounds started small and then just got bigger and bigger and bigger as time moved on. Yeah. Wow. Mound 34 is another cool one. Mound 34 revealed a copper workshop which is the Ooh. only known copper workshop to be found at a Mississippian culture site. And uh, analysis of the copper that was there, that was left there, showed that it had been annealed, which is basically what blacksmiths do with iron. It's heated, oh. and then as it cools, it's shaped, and then heated again, and then cooled and shaped. So and it makes it stronger. So they somehow had the ability to do that. Yeah, so they wow. you know, had the wherewithal and the ability to anneal this copper impressive also at Cahokia is a wood hinge very similar to england's well-known wood hinge and stone hinge a series of large timber circles arranged in arcs and many believe they were used as a calendar ah that's fascinating unfortunately we still don't know what happened to the mound builders of Cahokia. yeah they just kind of vanished right? they just left yeah well left or there was no mass 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 burials so it's really hard to tell. We know that the site was completely abandoned in the year 1300, and the area around it wasn't reoccupied until about 1350, and okay. scholars have proposed basically everything. It could have been environmental shit, like overhunting, deforestation, it could have been flooding. There was a lot of flooding there, apparently, in those years, oh, okay. um, possibly disease. Uh, possibly an invasion of outside people. Like, no one knows where they went. Wow. Ugh. Just like Roanoke, where did everybody go? Where did they go? <laughs> where yeah, did I they mean, go? You know, Cahokia Mounds, especially if it was, I mean, it was a very detailed city. Like, we know for a fact that people did li- live there. Um, yeah. You know, like I said, about 30,000. It was bigger than London. But if it was sort of like the place that everyone came there were there were definitely connections that these people that lived there had to other other civilizations in in the United States. So if if yeah. say there was major deforestation or there were floods or something, they had places that they could go. Right. They knew people and they could yeah. go be like, "Hey, we're uh we're moving into your town now." Yeah, that's true. So, so that's the Cokia Mounds and I am wow. 100% going to go back now that I'm an adult and actually like can yeah. appreciate it <laughs> yeah interested you know when you're a kid you don't really no you're such a punk when you're a kid i did not appreciate anything no no nothing especially though in our country where you know we knew about the trail of tears and we knew about mm-hmm. the disease and we knew that but we were still taught about thanksgiving being the day right. that the pilgrims and the indians came see, together. again indians <laughs> came yep. together and like shook hands and it's like shared a meal go fuck yourself like th- that's not history at all we were not taught anything correctly no. <laughs> it's insanity how much i'm learning even just this year i feel like i've learned so much i'm like why did no one ever tell me this i didn't know <sighs> about columbus i actually learned about columbus from i know we're not supposed to mention his name anymore but louis ck had a joke about yeah, he did. Columbus coming here. And it's yep. actually the Indians joke where he's like, You guys Indians? This India? Yep. And they're like, No. And he's like, Nah, you're Indians. Yeah. Like, oh <laughs> uh, yeah, this is India. You're Indians. You're Indians now. <laughs> no, it's so true. Yeah, Columbus was a piece of shit. Yeah, he was not great. Um, wanna hear another no! bad story? <laughs> this one is not as bad, which is why okay. I'm putting it right now because I think we need something to lift our spirits. Not that it's happy, but it's right. not a downer either. It's actually by suggestion of you, the Mattoon Gasser. Oh Jesus Christ. This scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. 
It's definitely scary, but it's not as dark as the other yeah. stories I have today. So that's why I thought I would throw this one in now. But it is crazy town. I can't believe it was a thing. And I cannot believe how it all ended. So I'm just very excited to tell this tale, everybody. So we're gonna we're gonna go back in time a little further. We were in the 80s before. We're hopping back to 1944. This all started August 31st, 1944, when a man woke up in his house feeling very sick. He immediately turned to his wife and asked if she had left the gas stove on because it sort of felt like that sensation. But when she tried out to get out of bed to go check, she was paralyzed and completely unable uh. to move besides lifting her head off her pillow. And it happened for about 30, 45 minutes, and then they finally were able to move. The stove was not on. They both are panicking. Like, what were they experiencing? What is going on? Why are they sick? Why was she paralyzed? Um, it turned out the next day they were talking to their neighbors about it. And before they even got the full story out, the neighbors told the exact same story. And were like, we felt really sick last night. My wife felt like she couldn't move her body. They compared notes. They had the exact same experience in the same night. Then the next night, a couple named the Kearneys had a situation as well. The wife was at home alone and she started to smell kind of a sweet gas smell coming in her house. It wasn't like the normal gasoline that we think of. It had kind of a sweet odor to it. She was smelling it pretty consistently for about 10 minutes. And then suddenly when she tried to move, she was paralyzed. She was able to scream even though her body couldn't move and she was able to get her neighbor's attention because she had an open window. The neighbors came in, saw her that she was saying she couldn't move and was freaking out. So they called the police. The police came and checked for a gas leak and nothing was found. And they just sort of dismissed her, which... It's so sad. She was like, um, I was freaking paralyzed. <laughs> but they were like, nope, there's nothing here. So they left and that was it. Then around midnight, her husband, Bert Kearney, came home and he was unaware of what had happened at all. He had been working late. But as he's pulling into the driveway, he noticed that there is a man all in black lurking by the house. And he thinks he's like a peeping Tom, was maybe looking in the window at his wife. So he gets out of the car, starts shouting, goes to scare him off. But the man was near a window, which would have been by his wife's bedroom. So he gets him to run away and then he can't see him anymore because it's, you know, it's late and he kind of disappears into the brush. And that was all there was of it from his point of view but he comes in obviously his wife freaks out so these two nights happen back to back what the hell is going on um it immediately gets released in the newspaper that something strange is going on but not a lot of details are given um the newspapers just kind of say like hey keep an eye out there's been like a lurker coming out at night people are experiencing some weird things but no details were given about the nausea getting paralyzed the smell of sweetness so no one would be able to make up a story if it happened to them but they were just kind of saying like be vigilant look out for what's going on so by the morning of september 5th just a few days later the mattoon police department had received reports of four more of these quote-unquote oh gas attacks God. the details of the attacks were all very similar between people again these are families that don't usually know each other could be on like in totally different neighborhoods, nothing was in the paper yet, but they're all saying the same thing, that they were smelling something sweet. Usually somebody became ill, and sometimes somebody was paralyzed for up to 30 minutes at a time. Um, also later that night on September 5th was, 5th was the first time a clue was potentially given from a clue. the gasser. A clue? Have we found something? What year was this? 1944. Mm. So I'm that's just picturing a guy with a... A big magnifying glass magnifying and a trench glass, coat. Yeah. <laughs> holding it up to his eye. I Finally, found a clue. a clue. There's been a break in the case. <laughs> um, so found at the home of a family named the Cords. They came home late one night and there was a white cloth lying on their porch. The wife picked it up and noticed that a strange smell was coming from it. So she kept sticking her face in it out of curiosity. But the more she smelled it, the more she got nauseated and lightheaded and almost fainted and had to sit down. So her husband helps her inside. And as he's trying to, you know, put a cold cloth on her head, make her feel better, her lips and her face begin to swell and blood starts coming out of her mouth. Oh, Jesus. These symptoms lasted for almost two hours. She's just bleeding and puffing up like a fish. Um, so they call the police. The police come and search the property, and on top of the cloth that was left, they also find a skeleton key, which is super creepy, and an empty tube of lipstick on the porch. So they came to the conclusion that a prowler was probably trying to break into the house somehow, but when they failed, they ran off and they dropped a couple things in the scuffle, which was the cloth and the lipstick. 
Later that night, the gasser attacked again, spraying gas into an open window, and the attacks continued for days. Mattoon guests were... were Mattoon residents, guests. <laughs> Mattoon residents, they were just hotel guests. Um, all of the residents began reporting these same gas attacks with similar, you know, symptoms, but then also what was becoming new to the story, because I guess this person was just being a little less careful, they were starting to get glimpses of a person. And it was always described as a tall, thin man in dark clothes wearing a tight black cap. More and more attacks kept coming, and the police were beginning to panic because other than that cloth and the lipstick tube, nothing was really getting left behind for the most part. There weren't clues. This is 1944. There's You're not no looking DNA. for DNA. Yeah. They had very little to go on. So they panic. <laughs> it's they call literally in the FBI. like the, the, the killer or her, the perpetrator has to still be there <laughs> when exactly. they get there. And then Hi, they'll solve um, the case. <laughs> I saw literally the guy standing by the tree. We did it. We did it. Solved. <laughs> yeah, they had nothing to go off of. The guy kept getting away. So they had to call in the FBI. Some FBI agents come in from Springfield. Hello, Capitol. <laughs> and <laughs> I just have to keep shouting out to Hello. Illinois. <laughs> Our Capitol. <laughs> So the FBI shows up and they're not really able to figure anything out either. They honestly just make the situation worse because there was already some panic starting to spread and the newspapers were sensationalizing everything, like making people just completely want to lock themselves in their house and never go outside. The newspapers are basically saying like, hunker down, this is horrible and everything is going to shit. The newspapers probably weren't sensationalizing it. It's probably like today where it's like, hey... Another 4,000 dead, and everyone's like, quit scaring people. Sure. And it's like, yes. well, we're reporting. That's the news. <laughs> no, you're right. What you want. <laughs> to be fair, they were just reporting what was happening. But, <laughs> but yeah. it's like, <laughs> they were making people panic. Out. And it's like, well, you should panic. Yeah. You might need to be careful in this situation. So people are freaking out. The FBI being in town just makes people panic even more. And then the rumors start to spread, which, of course, like everybody is going to start coming up with these theories, especially when the FBI comes into town. You're going to get excited and freaked out. So theories started to come forward that someone had escaped an insane asylum. Oh, or, I love that one. I know. Very fun. Or it was a German spy who was testing out some sort of love poisonous that gas one too. and picked this little Midwest town to do it. Totally into it. Probably not, but okay. <laughs> Probably not, but it's a good time to think about it. Um, and then, again, everybody just starts freaking out. So citizens start taking to the streets with guns, weapons, all kinds of things. Everyone starts protesting and is like, we're not going to take this anymore. We have to catch this guy. Uh, people start a vigilance group. There's all these little vigilantes that decide we're not going to sleep. We're just going to stand outside our houses and patrol the neighborhood and try to catch the gasser. And then during the day... People are just standing outside of, you know, City Hall or the police station and just straight up protesting and saying, you guys need to work harder. You need to catch this person. What are you doing? Yada, yada, yada. The town is going crazy. So authorities are working to try and control all the residents of Mattoon and say, like, chill out. It's going to be fine. We're here for you. While also staying up all night and driving around and trying to catch this mad gasser on the loose. So they had their work cut out for them. But apparently, this gasser was not scared at all of the newspapers, the protesters, the FBI, because they just kept a strike. And um, while all of this was going on, September 10th is what they say was like the peak. It's when everyone was going like the most insane. It was when the most fear was going throughout the town. It was probably September 10th, September 11th. But on both of these nights, the gasser attacked. The first incident was at the home of a Violet Driscoll and her daughter, they woke late in the evening to hear someone removing the storm door or like the storm window. Sorry, like that extra screen right. on their window was mm. removing it. So they woke up, they hurried out of bed and tried to run outside. But the fumes were so strong that Ramona, the daughter, keeled over and began throwing up. And her mother was able to get to the front door. But all she saw was a man in black running away from the house. Then just a short time later, the gasser sprayed fumes into a partially open window of a Russell Bailey and a few of his family members, um, including a very young son, which is very sad, but everyone survived. But they were very overcome with the lightheadedness, the dizziness and the sickness. Um, they began choking and exper experiencing partial paralysis in their legs and arms. And they also said that they believed they could see kind of a thin blue 
line coming in through the door, which they were the first people to say they saw anything visible. Everybody just said they smelled that sweet odor. And they these people said, we smelled the sweet odor, but we also saw a blue thin coloring coming in through the window, followed by a buzzing noise. So they believe they were hearing the apparatus actually in operation, which also nobody had heard. So that was kind of a big deal. I wouldn't say it was like a break in the case because still nobody caught the guy, but they were like, hey, like we heard a machine running. Something was happening. So again, September 10th and 11th, everybody's freaking out. FBI agents are working around the clock. These six more attacks happened between the 10th and the 11th, even with all this hysteria going on. So clearly nobody was scared. And then this was sort of the last straw for the local police of Mattoon. And this is the part of the story that I hate and I'm just in awe of because just idiot police not trying to actually help people, but just cover their ass. They were worried about this getting even more out of hand. Um, They didn't want this to be the only thing that people remembered about Mattoon. So they're like, we have to save the town. We have to end this no matter how. So they decide to start telling everybody that it's mass hysteria. They're all imagining it. (laughs) And it's just this collected imagination of the whole town that they're smelling gas and seeing a man in black. And being paralyzed and bleeding from the mouth and throwing up. And yeah. Okay. Yep. Sure. Well, that sounds like a cop. Yep. I know. I'm like, I'm not that surprised, but again, I I just can't help but get mad that they're just literally dismissing all of the symptoms that people felt, the small bits of evidence people had. I mean, people's screen doors were ripped open and there were footprints left in the ground. And um, even though it's not a lot to go on, it was still proof that like something was happening. There was a lurker. People were, you know, experiencing the sickness, like something was going on. This was not just imagination, but they decided to dismiss it as that. Um, The newspapers, again, like they were just reporting the news, like you said. So they were kind of going along with what the cops were saying. And their articles were starting to get more and more skeptical instead of saying, hey, everybody, be vigilant, be safe, watch out for your neighbors, watch out for yourself. They started saying like, hey, are you experiencing this or Or are you just thinking you are because your neighbor said it? So they're starting to get skeptical And police sort of just closed the case officially on September 12th. They're like, nope, you guys are all just experiencing this collected imagination. If you are smelling any sort of gas, it's probably coming from the local, it was called the Atlas Diesel Engine Company. Um, They were nearby and he thought maybe the wind was picking up scents from there that were coming in the windows. But even this company came forward and was like, "Uh, no, like it's (laughs) definitely not us. Like we... We don't have anything that smells like that, and there's no way that the wind would, like, pick us up and carry us all the way to these homes in Mattoon, and nothing would cause nausea or paralysis. So, you crazy. But the police were like, no, 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 it's all fine. We're, it's just the wind picking something up. And they totally dismissed it. Um, Luckily, this also kind of ended the gasser attacks, which I don't know how the things are attached or how that is possible. But September 13th, after that final statement was made on the 12th of saying this is just a case of mass hysteria, um, September 13th was the last attack and also one of the weirdest. It occurred at the home of a woman named Bertha Bench and her son Orville, which I was like, those are such 40s names, Bertha and (laughs) Orville. And they said their attacker this time was a woman who was just dressed in a man's clothing. But it was definitely a woman spraying gas into their bedroom window. Um, The next morning, they found footprints that appeared to be a high heel in the dirt. And uh, the figure that they saw, like, they are both 100% sure that it was a woman that was running away along with the high heels. So that was a little bizarre because it was the first time that someone had said a female. But then we look back to the lipstick tube that was left behind. True. And we're like, well... Could have been a lady all along and everyone just assumed it was a man, but maybe she was dressed up in men's clothing and she was just happened to be a tall woman or her heels made her very tall. I don't know. So that was interesting. Um, And then the attack stopped after that one. That was the last report. The gasser just decided to skip town, maybe move on to somebody else. Who knows? But, of course, theories have been going on for years and years. As much as nobody wanted Mattoon to be known for this, they totally are. Yeah. (laughs) Um, they're known for the mad gasser and people like to theorize that maybe it was an extraterrestrial visitor trying out a paralyzing agent. Maybe it was, I know, I thought that was fun. 
Maybe it's the military trying something out. Um, maybe it was an, a new inventor who really was wanting to try out their new apparatus and just decided Mattoon was the place to do it. This little Midwest town, maybe they could get away with it. All kinds of things. Um, so whatever you want to believe, you can, whether it was an alien, a German spy, or what else was there? What did I say earlier? I forget now. There was a fun theory. Uh, alien, German spy. Those are the only ones I Let remember. Sc- I or know. A, um... I said something else, but I forget. I'd have to scroll way up in my notes and I'm too lazy to find it. But yeah, you can believe whatever you want. But somebody was spraying something. There is no way this was just a case of mass hysteria. I don't doubt that Some mass hysteria them. can happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And also I that there might can, have but... been one or two people that thought yes. honest to god thought it was happening 100 percent. um but yeah that just seems that just seems so weird i i wouldn't think that no i it's not mass hysteria no. i know it's not i mass don't hysteria. think so either i'm sure there were yeah like you said there were some people that maybe convinced themselves they were experiencing something or maybe a mm-hmm. couple people were even a cry for attention like yeah. who knows but I don't think this was just made up completely out of the blue or somebody's imagination. There's too many things that point to well, the situation actually Well, it may even be happening. the reason that it stopped when it did. It was the first time it was reported that it was a woman. And like you said, you know, the lipstick was an earlier clue that it could have been a woman. And maybe right. they just were like, okay, I can't do that. I'm going to get caught. They're getting too close now. Yeah, and like they're, now they, yeah, they're at on least, my trail. you know, before they were looking for a dude. It's a man. At least yeah. they were looking for a man. Now they're like, it might be a woman. It's like, shit, I'm right. okay. Retired. I'm yeah. retired. All right, I got to get out of here. I kind of like the idea that it was a woman. I don't know if it's just, you know. Because the... there's not enough of us that are serial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like we've celebrated this on the podcast before when we were talking about women serial killers. Where we were like, you know, just female empowerment. We can do <laughs> yeah. it too. Listen, we can do Which anything sounds... you can do. <laughs> So inappropriate, but I just like the idea of this woman running around in her high heels, got her red lipstick on, just like, I'm going to spray a little gas. It's not going to kill anybody. Just make them feel a little sick. And she's just skipping around. (laughs) I don't know. It just made me surprised. Man, I don't know. Because that's another vote towards mass hysteria. I'm surprised no one did die. Agreed. So that's why you can argue that it's mass hysteria. It sucks because there's a lot of points to that side, but I don't know. Yeah, and it I mean, always, yeah, it always happened in the evening too, mm-hmm. where people could be asleep or dreaming or, you know, yeah. conjuring something up in their mind. So there are a lot of points to that. And actually, I also read that um, a lot of colleges, especially in the Midwest, in psychology classes will talk about this case and they talk about like a collected imagining and mass hysteria and how that works like this is a story from psychology teachers because they're so fascinated by it and if this town truly was all imagining this like how bizarre so it's brought up in a lot of schools but how i don't bizarre. know i how bizarre how bizarre <laughs> i'm i err more on the side of i think something actually happened but i have no idea yeah i wasn't there <laughs> i wasn't there in wasn't 1944 there uh, what you got next? Well, we seem to keep be going back further and further. <laughs> oh, God. Which is great. I Well, I, I guess like the it. Cahokia thing was way back. And when, then we jumped forward. Yeah, now we're going back far. again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a case known as the Watsika Wonder uh, from Watsika, Ooh. Illinois. So Watsika, Illinois is a small town that's about 75 miles south of Chicago. And in 1877... A young girl lived there with her family. Her name was Laurency Venom. And Ooh. Venom, V-E-N-N-U-M, not V-E-N-O-M. Okay, so not. I, I was feel like, like, what that. a fun name. Yeah. I feel like that makes a little bit of a difference. Um, <laughs> and she was born in 1864. In the summer of 1877, when she was 13 years old, she started suffering from what seemed to be epileptic fits, often ending in a period of unconsciousness. Well, after one pretty severe seizure and subsequent period of unconsciousness, she woke up and started telling her family that she had been to heaven. 
She oh, had okay. seen angels. She even got to visit her younger brother and sister who had died before her. So oh, wow. they were like, we're locking you up in an asylum. <laughs> we're putting you away. The doctors literally said, like, there's nothing they could do for her. Um, her fits became more and more frequent, and she had crazy stories every time. So they were like, just put her away. She's obviously bonkers. Yeah. But a neighbor and devout spiritist convinced them not to do that, but to call in a physician that she knew who was also a spiritist named E. Winchester Stevens. Uh, so spiritists are basically a combination of real science and spirituality. So like spiritualists, they believe in souls and mediumship and ghosts, etc. But they also attempt to put it to work in the real world. Okay. Makes sense. So anyway, he comes to treat Laurency. And word of this weird girl who sees angels spread. So she kind of became popular and spiritualists were coming from all over just to try and speak with her. And everyone in the town basically knew what was going on, even though no one knew exactly what was going on. Yeah. So on the morning of July 11th, 1877, Laurency was feeling very strange and she collapsed on the floor. She stayed in a deep, unwakeable sleep for five hours. Whoa. That is but a long time. But when she woke sleep. up, it's a long time and like unwakeable, not like, oh, she fell asleep. Like that's a long nap, but they could not wake her up. Jeez. But she woke up and she seemed totally fine. She felt fine. But then the next day, she once again fell into an unwakeable sleep. But this time she was speaking out loud about what she was seeing. Oh. And then from that day on, they referred to these like unwakeable sleeps where she was talking as trances. And from that day on, the trances became to occur more and more frequently and would sometimes last for up to eight hours. Oh, OK. That is That's far too long. And just to have her like basically be unconscious, but still speaking things out loud, yeah. I would be freaking out if I was her family. Yeah. Member. And as soon as that happened, uh, you know, they would call the spiritists, they would call E. Winchester Stevens and he would come over if he wasn't already there and monitor her, you know, put the um, they didn't have any machines or anything, but put like the blood pressure, like check her blood pressure, make sure that she still had a pulse. Um, and yeah. then when she started speaking through them, you know, they at least knew she was alive, but like they could right. not wake her up. And Dang. when that started to happen, when she started like speaking in the middle of these, she began to experience spirits and stuff while she was awake too, without seizures oh, happening. Wow. She saw them all over the house. Uh, they were constantly talking. They would drive her crazy. And there were several times where they chased her through the home. Oh, my gosh. It was at this time she also began to speak in other languages uh, in the trances, some that no one was even able to identify. Oof. But then she started to wake up from these trances and remember nothing. Like before, she was kind of like, yeah, I remember I was here and I was seeing this. Now she's not remembering it at all. She's just like. She was like blacking out. Blacking out, basically, even though she's still talking and having conversations like she doesn't remember what the conversations are. Man. So very weird. The following year in 1878, a man named Asa Roff shows up and says, you know, I heard about Laurency's condition and I had to come here to tell you that my late daughter, Mary, had the same affliction that Laurency has the seizures and the visions. He was totally convinced that his daughter was talking to spirits and he was also convinced that now his daughter was a spirit and that it was possible she was inside Laurency Venom. Ooh. So everyone was like, Spooky. hold up, Asa. <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? <laughs> um, so Asa told Mary's story. Mary uh, Roth was born in 1846, and she started having fits like right away. She was six months old. Jeez. And as she That's aged, six months? yeah, she was like a baby baby when she started having little seizures. But as she aged, the fits gradually increased in violence. Um, she ended up, unfortunately, killing herself in 1865 at the age of 19 after spending years in the state mental asylum in Peoria, your hometown. Hey, Peoria. The one that we talked about or a different I don't one? know. I couldn't tell. Oh, wait. This is I what could... we talked about last mm -hmm. week, right? When you were yeah. like, yeah. Okay. It just said state mental hospital in Peoria. And also, um, you know, you said that castle wasn't built until like 1890 something, right? Right. Yeah. 
So this was 1865. So Interesting. Okay, continue. No one knows if the suicide was intentional. She had slit her wrist with a razor. So you'd think like, duh, it was. But that was kind of something she had done before. So when she was a child, she would constantly complain of hearing mysterious voices. Like they kept her up at night and they distracted her from school and they were driving her mad. And she started to experience long periods in a trance-like state. And when she would wake from them, she would speak in other voices and say that she was other people that no one had ever heard of. And at the age of 15, she became obsessed with blood and she was convinced that she had to remove the blood from her body. She would use pins, leeches, and finally she moved on to a razor. And I think she felt that if she got rid of her blood and her body made all new blood, she wouldn't have this affliction anymore. Is kind of what it seemed like. Yeah. Ugh. That's so sad and scary. Yeah. But anyway, so obviously she was tortured in the institution. It's not like people got to go home eventually back then. So yeah, she probably did purposefully kill herself. So... I don't know. But this is all important to know because she died in 1865 and Laurency Venom was born in 1864 and the family didn't move to Watsika until 1871. So they didn't know anything about Mary Roth's death or illness or anything. Okay. So that's bizarre. Yeah. So Asa Roth, the father of Mary, he actually knew of Laurency's condition for months But he didn't Uh say anything until he had heard that the doctors were out of options and were planning to send her to the Peoria State Mental Institution. And he showed up begging them not to, saying that they basically killed his daughter. Like she would have lived if he had not committed her to the asylum. Yeah. So the family, along with Asa Roth and E. Winchester Stevens, began trying to work with her spiritually since medically nothing was working. Yeah. They were purposefully putting her into trances and attempting to contact spirits through her, like actually talk to these voices that were coming out. And immediately they got results. Um, The first try, Laurency began speaking in another voice, which allegedly came from a spirit named Katrina Hogan. Then the spirit and the voice changed and claimed to be that of Willie Canning, a young man who committed suicide. And again, the voice coming out of her was a male voice. Oh, that... Just sends chills up the creepy. <laughs> she <laughs> spoke to them as Willie for over an hour. And then she suddenly threw her arms in the air and fell over backwards. Like the whole chair fell over backwards. She was still in a oh. trance. So she didn't like react at all. <laughs> Which is like how someone could do that. Like right, faking to it. fall backwards and then I, I don't be know. totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. And not like, react. Okay, something's going on. When they brought her back up. She basically, like, very dreamlike said, she's going to go away for a little bit, and someone else was coming. And they were like, okay. And the next time she spoke, she said her name was Mary Roth. Wow. But here's the thing. Mary Roth wouldn't leave. What? She wouldn't leave. Mary was stuck? She wouldn't leave the body. She wasn't stuck. She refused to leave the body. She was just like, I'm here now. This is my body. Yeah. And she wanted to go home with her family, the Roths, but obviously her family, the Venoms, were like, uh, no. (laughs) No thanks. (laughs) They, your family can come visit you. So they did. There was one instance where Mary's mother and sister showed up at the house to meet Laurency slash Mary as, and, um, as they walked up the sidewalk, Laurency pointed and said, here comes Ma and Nervy and ran out the door and ran up to hug them. And oh no one had called Minerva Nervy except for Mary when she was alive. <gasps> Whoa. They have no idea how she could have known. Like she would have had no way to know that unless no. Mary was there. Ooh. Laurency knew everything about the Roth family and she treated them like loved ones. She was polite to her own family, to the Venoms, but like not super stoked to be living with them. Yeah. So like her family let her go live with the Roths. <gasps> oh, what? They were like, okay. <laughs> I mean, they weren't like, okay, but they were like, I mean, I guess they thought. Oh, man. It was probably very sad, but they, they said they thought it was what was best for Laurency and Mary. Yeah. Like they thought it was what was best for this whole situation. 
Yeah, I mean, so, I guess you get to a point where you just truly don't know what to do. But yeah. But, man, that would be so hard. It would be hard to watch your daughter leave to go live with this family. But here's the thing. They lived, like, across town. So it's not like she's going to live in, like, the Amazon with this family. Right. So She's not going to another country. <laughs> yeah. And when the Roth family took her home, they passed by the former Roth home where the family lived when Mary died. And when they passed it, she was confused. And she asked why they weren't going there. And they had to explain to her that they had moved a couple years earlier. Oh, my god! Like, she 100% she knew. knew. And like I said, by the time when, when they moved to this town, Mary had died. They had no idea wow. about Mary's life or her death or anything. Yeah. They would have no reason to know any of that. Yeah. That is so wild. And you have to remember, Laurency was 13. So this Ugh, is a very young girl. So young. Yeah. So Laurency She wouldn't have lived... been like studying or knowing no, anything. No, she like... wouldn't have had the wherewithal to be like, I'm going to concoct this crazy plan. Exactly. Wow. So Laurency lived as Mary with the Ra family for several months, about eight months. Yeah. And while she was living there, her physical condition improved. She didn't have seizures anymore. She wasn't getting attacked by spirits. But in early May of 1879, Mary told her family that it was about time for her to leave. And she Aww. was incredibly depressed. And some days all she would do is go from family member to family member and just like hold them. Oh. Because she didn't want to so leave. so sad. She was crying all the time. She said she didn't want to leave her family. And then over the next couple of weeks, there seemed to be a battle for who got to live in the body. I don't know if that's exactly what was going on, but that's kind of what it seemed like because Laurency would be there attempting to leave and then Mary would come back crying and cling to her father and say, I don't want to leave. Yeah. Oh, so my goodness. on May 19th of that year, Laurency took over for good and Mary was gone. Oh, wow. On May 21st, she returned to her family and she had none of the symptoms that she had had before. So yeah. she was convinced that she was cured. And she was either cured by the spirit of Mary Roth as a, like, thank you for letting her have the time with her family. Right. Or cured by the fact that Mary finally left her body. Like, maybe Mary had gotten in from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And she started having seizures and experiencing all the things that Mary had experienced in her life. But Mary wasn't right. able to take over. She the was, body like, taking on her ailments. Yeah. Uh I don't know how possessions work. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Happy ending. Laurency <laughs> married when she turned 18. They moved Aww. to Kansas um and they had 11 children. What how 11. why I so I don't know if I that is a happy like ending. I'm I not sure. Just don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it was happy for them, but to me that sounds like a. Nightmare I feel like ending, once you have like three or four, though, you basically you only like, have care. three or four because then they become the parents to the, all the others. Right. So like, you have to you physically the have them, but like then you're like, but we have babysitters forever, forever. Man, 11 kids. Yeah, and she died in the late 1940s. She said that later on in her life when, when she was asked about this experience, she said that she didn't really get possessed anymore. Like that wasn't something that happened to her anymore, except during two of her childbirths, her body oh. was taken over and she thinks that it was to save her from the pain. Like they were particularly oh painful childbirths. And she said and someone that, was trying to help. Yeah, someone came in and, and basically, like, did it for her. Well, what a nice spirit I or know. demon or whatever you want to call it. Because, again, I don't know exactly how possessions work. But, <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, that naturally. a wild ride. <laughs> this case has plenty of critics uh, saying sure. that she faked it all. But... I don't know. I feel like a 14-year-old, 13, 14-year-old having real seizures and going into 8 to 10-hour trances seems like it might be impossible. Like, I yeah. wouldn't have been able to fake a 12-minute trance when I was 14. Oh, how could you fake it for hours? Hours. And then just knowing all of that really intimate information about mm -hmm. the family, there is just no explanation for that. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And it actually, this story was the first time that I started, you know, because I've always had a, tr I, I've always had trouble believing in demons. Like I've always been interested mm -hmm. by exorcism stories. My favorite movie is The Exorcist and The Exorcist mm -hmm. 3. Um, 
like I love it, but I've always had that problem with demons possessing people. But right. if you look at this case, she was being possessed, but she was being possessed by people. But right. she still people had those, had ones, yeah, but she still had those weird things happen. She still had like the seizures and the fits and she was still like right. uh, kind of acting crazy and, and violent and um, talking in different voices. So, yeah. I don't know, it's something interesting to think about the next time you hear about an exorcism of right. it possibly not necessarily being a demon, but being a person who just isn't ready to... They haven't moved on yet. Get out. They needed they needed to find a vessel before they went. And now it makes me wonder about um, some people with multiple personality disorder. And, like, I don't want to criticize that actually very real disorder, but it does make me wonder if some people could potentially be experiencing a possession of yeah, a person. Yeah, even if it's or just, if it like, always a, a channeling of some right. kind. Like, they're just a very strong channel. Right. And they don't know. For sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting to think about, too. Yeah, because you think about, like, Man. mediums who, because there are some mediums who allow spirits to speak through them. You know, supposedly, right. I've never done this. I don't know if it's real. Um, yeah. So there maybe is a possible way to be able to be present while that happens. And maybe yeah. there's a possibility that if you're not someone who knows what you're doing, that you aren't present at all. Right. When it happens. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways, so that's uh, Watsika wow. Wonder. It's kind of a crazy story. That is nuts. I also didn't know there was a Watsika, Illinois, so yeah, you opened surprise. my eyes to that. <laughs> <laughs> I live on a street called Watsika, so oh my it's gosh, meant to be. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, you I do. love it. Well, we're going to cap it off with another murder. Sorry, do everybody. <laughs> this one is not as dark as the first one. It's definitely still dark. Um, and I actually picked it because when I first start, you're going to think that it actually is very similar to the other story that I read. They have a lot of parallels and similarity similarities, but very different endings. So yeah, that's sort of why I picked these two, because I thought it was interesting. They both involve families. So we do have some family deaths again. I apologize, but it is a lot less dark than the first one, I promise. Okay, here we go. This time, as I said, I was trying to pick places that related to us somehow. I went to college in Bloomington, Illinois, so that's where this takes place. Um, Illinois State is there for anyone who wants to know. Go Redbirds. <laughs> and also, funny enough, my high school and college mascot was a Redbird, and I'm a huge St. Louis Cardinals fan, so Redbirds Weird. just, like, follow me all around. Um, yeah, I thought that was bizarre. Just a fun side note. So this is about the Hendricks family in Bloomington, Illinois. We're going back to the 80s, so we're not going backwards anymore, flashing back forward to November of 1983. Um, David Hendricks was a businessman, a salesman. He sold orthopedic parts, like he would sell back braces and different prosthetics that could help people's backs, and he would go to different towns and show what these different mechanisms could do. He would like do photo shoots, blah, blah, blah. He was like very involved in this orthopedics business. So he was going away on business in Wisconsin on November 4th, 1983. Then over the weekend, because I believe this was a Friday, he several times tried to contact his family. He had a wife and two kids back home. And every time he tried to get a hold of them, as he claims, he wasn't getting an answer. So he decided to call some neighbors, some other family members, and say, can you check in with my family? I haven't heard from them. Other people tried to call them. A neighbor even went and knocked on the door and had no answer. So finally, there was a wellness check with the police. And they said, can you go in and check? Um, we're very worried. We haven't heard from them. So on November 7th, just a few days later, finally, the police decided to go in and check. Um, they walked inside. It looked like there was no forced entry. Nothing was like tipped over nothing looked crazy but as the police officer went upstairs he noticed that the wife and the children were all dead in their beds as if they had been killed in their sleep and laying on one of the kids beds was an axe and a butcher knife there was very little sign of a struggle from any of the family members and police did think that the crime scene was suspicious because there was no forced entry and the killings were so brutal that they immediately thought well, this sort of seems like it was a family member, someone close to them. Again, very similar to the first case I talked about. 
So then that night of November 7th, David Hendricks comes home and walks in looking just as surprised as everybody else saying like, oh my God, what happened here? My family was murdered. What's going on? They tell him everything that happened, but he stays very calm and he keeps saying, I'm just numb. I'm in shock. I can't believe this happened, but he's not crying. He's not getting hysterical. He's just sort of quiet, which police immediately think is weird. They start questioning him. They look through his suitcase, through all of his clothes to look for bloodstains. There's nothing crazy that they find. It's pretty much inconclusive. And he did have a good alibi that he was in Wisconsin. But they start to ask him about the night of November 4th, which is when he left. And they his Hendrick's story is that he took his kids to a pizza place at about 7.30 p.m. that night. And according to him, they played uh, on the playground after they ate pizza and then they returned home at about 9 30 and then Hendrix left for his trip at 11 30 that night and was planning on just like driving through the night but after studying the children's bodies the medical examiner found that his story did not quite match up oh, because boy. the food in the stomach of the kids which i didn't even realize this was a thing but the food in the stomach of the kids wasn't um, fully digested, which they said it takes food about two hours time to travel into the lower intestine, which would, if they were eating at 730, like he said, the food would have, you know, traveled out between like 930 or 10, but the food was still stuck in the stomach, meaning that like something traumatizing happened to the body. So they believe the murder happened around nine o'clock while David Hendricks was still home, according to his story. So they... Um, bring him back in for more questioning. He keeps saying that his story is true, and he even tries to bring up other science and says, like, oh, well, I think if physical activity is involved, sometimes that slows the digestion. My kids were playing on a playground. Like, he was trying to think of all this stuff, but the police believed they had enough to go on, and they charged him with the murder of his family. They didn't really have a motive either, which wasn't great on their side because the Hendricks family was very religious. They were part of this group called the Plymouth Brethren, which was like a Puritan type group, which sounds awful to me, but to each their own. Um, the women <laughs> had to wear like the long skirts yeah. and have their hair pulled back certain ways. And just everything was very conservative. You had to live, you know, such a conservative specific life. So Right. But sometimes that sort of um drives people to madness yeah that'll drive you especially <laughs> if you f if you feel oppressed yes that sort of like constant sure. oppression can can yeah. build up and if it's already i mean it's not gonna make like me like snap but it could make a person who already has it in them snap totally i agree with you but the defense was trying to make this argument uh, like totally the opposite yeah. of saying like well he was religious he was perfect so the defense was going with that. They were also really holding on to that physical activity defense that that's why the kids' food was still in their stomach. But the prosecution came back pretty heavy, sort of saying what you just said. Like, well, maybe if you're in a religion like that, you can snap. Or maybe he really wanted to cheat on his wife or be in another relationship, but knew his religion didn't, you know, believe in, obviously, adultery. Nobody really supports that. But also, they didn't support divorce. So it was like maybe he felt stuck and this was his only way out if he wanted to be in a relationship with anyone. True. So then they start to bring up all these things, which there's not a ton of evidence for it. They were really just trying to pull out whatever they had. The prosecution started to say that when David Hendricks would go to these photo shoots and the models um, at the photo shoots would have to try on the back braces and model all of his different prosthetics like they started to bring up all these stories of him hitting on these women and they went out and interviewed some of the women and probably coerced them into saying that he did so then they had that defense that he was kind of a sleaze bag yada 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 and even with like none of the really conclusive concrete evidence somehow their argument made it through and the jury convicted him and said he was guilty and the judge, this is like where it also gets interesting. The judge said, okay, you're guilty and I'm sentencing you to uh, four life imprisonment sentences. However, I have the option to give you the death penalty and I'm not because I do not believe without a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. There's just not enough here for me. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm trying not to judge the jury. I think these are good people and they took we have to the evidence for what decision. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like, I'm going to respect these people and I'm going to give you life in prison, but I don't know if I think you're guilty. And he kind of left it as that. So this became a huge controversy the second David Hendricks went to jail. 
Um, books came out about it. A lot of people actually siding with him and saying like, yes, he's the only suspect that makes sense, but also you have no evidence to go against him. Like nothing points to this guy. He was in Wisconsin. You don't know if the murders actually happened while he was still in town, blah, blah, blah. So it was enough stirring up and talking about it that by uh, 1991, he was first convicted in 1988. I don't know if I said the year. So then flash forward 1991, the Supreme Court actually overturns the case and says they want to do a retrial because they're like, we're hearing you guys like people made enough of a ruckus. And they were like, I want to look back into this. Well, he's obviously not black. Yes, Ashley. Yeah, 100 (laughs) percent. It's a white man. Go on. Um, So, no, you're so right. So he gets retried in 1991 and is found not guilty. Whoa. <laughs> he actually gets out alive and decides to go live a normal life. Like nothing even phases this guy. He's let out of prison. He decides to move to Florida. He marries a new woman. He drops all of his religious ties and said while he was in prison, he just completely decided that religion is not for him and it was actually holding him back. And he moves to Florida, starts up another orthopedic um, business doing the same thing but this time i think originally he was just a salesperson and this time he like ran the business himself um and the last i read he sold his business and is now retired and is like a millionaire in florida with his wife just like living the dream and the case itself is still completely unsolved because he was the only suspect that made any sense and now there's nothing nobody has anything to go off of there was no DNA left at the scene. The axe and the knife were both cleaned. Um, The only blood found on them was those of the kids and the mother. And they're back at square one and have no idea who did it, even though I really think it was David and he's just living in Florida free. Well, great. (laughs) That's that's the Hendrix story. Yeah, I mean, the... (sighs) I was going to say the the whole, you know, maybe he wanted to cheat on his wife and divorce wasn't legal thing. Like, maybe, but I don't think that that would drive a man to kill his children. I, that's the whole thing. So I, get I don't it, think that's the a wife. good motive. That's like, that's a tale as old as time of both men and women, because women do it. If you watch the show Snapped, women do it all the time. Um, spouses kill each other when they want to get out of the marriage and feel they have no other yeah, way. They like, feel that trapped. does happen. But to murder your children, yeah. like... Especially when it, even though, as we're saying, like, yes, he could have just had a lot build up um, in him from living such a conservative life with the Plymouth Brethren. But also, like, to not see any signs in this guy, that's another thing that doesn't match up. Maybe with the wife, because anyone can snap on their spouse. But again, it doesn't make sense with the kids for him to have not shown any aggression whatsoever. Just feels weird to go on a rampage and kill your kids in their sleep but i don't know it is just weird like the whole food in the stomach thing is a a crazy science that i didn't even know but it also is sort of like well okay it looks like something traumatizing happened to them very shortly after you guys ate pizza so sort of seems like it was you i don't know it's all very fishy with the the no forced entry and the the area being so clean, which again, it's crazy how many pl- parallels there were to the first story that I said. But in this case, the dad kind of seems like he did it. But I don't know. We will never know. I have a feeling. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to end on a depressing wah, wah, note, weirdos, wah. but there you go. <laughs> Have to get our true crime fix every once in a while. Yeah, well, that's the the amazing thing about Hometown Haunts. We got everything in there. We got ghosts, <laughs> we really murders, do. monsters, possessions, <laughs> Native Americans. <laughs> anyway, That's right. That's all the time we have this week for Keep It Weird. As usual, thank you so much for listening to our show. If you're listening on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app right now and you haven't already, please rate us five stars or please whatever amount of stars you think is fair. The five star ones are just our favorite ones. We like them a lot. We like them the most. If you want to support the show in a financial way, even if it's just a one-time donation, head to our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash keepitweirdpodcast and give us one, five, or ten dollars and get bonus episodes, newsletters, and discounts on merch in return. Follow us on social media at Keep It Weirdcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter sometimes. And join our Facebook group if you want to talk about the world's current weird 
events. My gosh, the Facebook group is so much fun right now. I, I love I am having <sighs> such a blast. Thank you guys who are a part of it already for all the fun <laughs> stories you're bringing and great memes. And to those of you who are not a part of it yet, please join us. We're having a blast. Yeah, we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> and actually, I think we should have, you know, a weekly MVP. And this week it was Kennedy Cranford. She yes. alerted us to the burning ship. Yes, fire the ship. ship. On fire. <laughs> we needed it. Um, the sign off this week is Come on, Illinois Two girls from Illinois We've got corn, corn, corn (laughs) That's as far as I got (laughs) Oh, we do have corn We have so much corn We also have wheat But I do remember there being a lot of corn Um, That's right Keep it weird Keep it weird We are the champs. <laughs> we are the, are the champions. <laughs> it's now an opera. <laughs> we. we.